Every habit and capability is confirmed and grows in its corresponding actions, walking by walking and running by running. Therefore, if you want to do something, make a habit out of it. And if you don't want to do that, don't, but make a habit of something else instead. The same principle is at work in our state of mind. When you get angry, you've not only experienced that evil, but you've also reinforced a bad habit, adding fuel to the fire. Epictetus. In, uh, in short, basically, do things on purpose and make a habit out of doing the right thing. All right. We're going to talk about performance and weight and balance today. It's a lot of ca uh, calculations and math, so I kind of like it. Uh, like we usually do, we'll start with a scenario. Uh, if you have researched something about medicine and alcohol in the cockpit, now's a great time to talk about it. Otherwise, we're just going to get right into it, and then we'll do our quiz and assign some homework. Okay, so here's our scenario. We are departing from Alpine County, Mike 4-5, right? Uh, and our aircraft is slightly overweight. The temperature outside is 40 degrees Celsius. The altimeter setting is 28.10 inches of mercury. And there's a 50-foot obstacle at the end of the runway. So we're going to talk about how you would basically calculate this and see if this is a, a smart decision to make. Um, would you like to give it a try or do you want me to just kind of jump into it and, and show you how it's done? Me? Yeah. <laughs> Calculate what? So we're trying to calculate. So we, we well, first of all, uh, yeah, let me, let me back up here. So before we depart, we always want to do this set of things, right? Where is my pen? There it is. Northwest craft, right? Uh, and one of those items is the runway and takeoff and uh, landing distance calculations. And so we always check out our density altitude chart to see what the airplane is going to feel like it, uh, or what the airplane is going to think uh, the altitude that it feels like is at. And uh, this is essentially how we do it. We're going to go to the um, altimeter setting, 28.10. And 28.10 is here. Uh, so just looking at it, before we even look at the, um, at the chart, uh, a hot day and low pressure, like low um, air pressure, is, uh, what, do you think is gonna do that, what do you think that's going to do to our performance? Uh, it will decrease performance. Yeah, it's going to degrade our performance. We're probably going to end up with a longer uh, runway takeoff or longer distance takeoff. And it's going to, you know, just not respond as effectively. It's going to be pretty sluggish. So let's actually do the calculations. So first, the pressure altitude conversion factor, 1727, we're going to add that to our field elevation. And part of this is like knowing how to read the, uh, the chart as well. So if Alpine County here, 5872, that's our field elevation. We're going to add 5872 plus 1727. So that's 9, 9, 8 is 15, 5, 6, 7. So our, our field elevation is, or our pressure altitude is 7,600 feet. So, you know, just because of the pressure setting, we've basically added, you know, an extra 1,800 feet almost. Then we're going to find our temperature, 40 degrees Celsius, and we do want to be careful you know, using t uh, Fahrenheit or Celsius, uh, find 40 degrees, which is somewhere over here, and uh, plot it against our pressure altitude of 7,599. So 7,509 is somewhere over here, and somewhere over here, right? And then we're going to read our density altitude. And remember, the pressure altitude are these diagonal lines. So this would be one of these diag diagonal lines. And just a rough estimate, because I don't have my ruler out, somewhere like between 11,000 feet um, is our density altitude. So our, our aircraft thinks it's already at 11,000 feet as we depart on this really hot, really low pressure day. Uh, and we're slightly overweight. So at the end of the day, is this a smart decision to make? Should we depart with uh, this situation? Nope. Yeah, probably not. You know, it's, it's not going to be a safe uh, departure. So let's figure out how much takeoff distance we need for this field. Um, so that was the density altitude. This is going to be our um, our takeoff distance. So first, we're going to find our pressure altitude, which was like 7,600, I think, uh, somewhere between these two, and our temperature is 40 degrees Celsius. So this takeoff chart uh, will essentially take in, uh, the temperature into account for you. Instead of using the density altitude, we need the pressure altitude. So something to keep in mind. And it's somewhere between these two 3,775 and 4,465, the total to clear a 50 foot obstacle. So uh, we'll shoot, you know, split it from something like 4,000 feet 
and the field was 5,872 feet. Yeah, so theoretically, you know, we could depart um, this field. It might be a little close. Uh, the last bit of it, though, is that slightly overweight. You know, you're really, you're really tempting fate uh, trying to take off like that. So yeah, at the end of the day, this is a pretty clear example of uh, a flight you should not uh, take, but let's see what happens when we do it anyway. I have a so question. This is, yeah, send it. So um, we're using pressure altitude, right? Not density altitude. Yes. So it would be 5,000 and not 7,500? 7, 7, uh, no, so our, our field elevation here is 5,872. This is our pressure altitude conversion factor. So uh, we, yeah. So this it. is how we convert to pressure altitude. Okay. Yes. Awesome question. Yeah, and, that, and then that 11,000 would be our density altitude. So here, it's, it's kind of giving you the density altitude. It's like, what's your pressure altitude? With this, this is going to be your density altitude, uh, the distance you need, uh, given this temperature. Gotcha. Yeah, so let's watch what happens if we actually try to do, depart. I built in all the uh, factors into the simulator and try to depart, and let's see how, how well it goes. <clears throat> all right doing our short field technique so i just put in 10 degrees of flaps full brakes full power now release the brakes and we're uh, rolling down the runway air speed's alive so it's coming up the air the needle's moving and we rotate at 55 knots so we'll see how that goes or 55 or 50 knots for a short field Yeah, and here I'm, tr I'm struggling to get it into a climb. We got like a 300 foot per minute rate of climb. Not great. All right, so I've cleared the hill. I'm going to try to nose down to pick up some airspeed and climb at 79 for our VY or 65 for VX. Having a hard time getting up to that airspeed, though. So at this point, I think I try to turn back to the runway to try to land it, and we'll see how, go how well that goes. Well, the good news is we probably would have survived that. Um, but uh, yeah, again, that's not a good decision to make to depart overweight at a high density altitude. Um, something to keep in mind, since most of the fields around this area are pretty close to sea level, uh, we kind of get spoiled. We don't really have to worry about um, you know high density altitude flying for the most part. So it's something we really want to pay attention to as, uh, as safe pilots. Uh, so there's that. Yeah, cool. Can I ask a clarification? Sure. The the climb rate indicator is the one next to the the compass, right? Yeah, this is uh, the vertical speed indicator. So this tells you how fast you're climbing or descending. So five hundred feet per minute climb descent, right? Cool. Yeah. All right.
Uh, did you happen to take a look in or like study alcohol and medicine in the cockpit? No. <laughs> okay, no worries. That's all right. It's cool. Not a big deal. We'll move on. All right, so we're going to talk about performance today uh, and basically interpreting our charts and seeing you know, how we can uh, use them to be safe, efficient pilots. Uh, this is a cruise power setting chart. Uh, we can find our cruise power settings by using this table. Uh, it is based on 65% max, max continuous power, and there are three separate sections for different temperatures. So a standard day, if they tell you the situation is standard, then we're going to use the middle chart. If it's a cold day, and if it's a hot day, it's over here. Uh, you may be in, asked to interpolate, by the way. So if they ask you for like a uh, something between these two, let's say instead of 27 or 17, they say 10 degrees Celsius, we'll need to find the, uh, we'll need to interpolate between the two charts, these two. Or if they ask for like 7,000 feet, we'll need to interpolate between these two. And we'll, we'll talk about it here in a minute. Um, so here's an example. We need to find the true airspeed for, for 7,500 feet at ISA, that's International Standard Atmosphere, uh, at uh, plus 20 degrees Celsius, so a, a hot day. So we're going to use the, the, the hot side of the chart, ISA plus 20. And here's our interpolation formula. Um, basically, I like to think of it as, as a ratio. What we know minus the low, the high minus the low, uh, equals what we don't know, what we need to find, minus the low uh, over the high minus the low. What that looks like, let's see, <clears throat> if we know that uh, we're at 7,500 feet, that's going to be somewhere between these two. Uh, X1, the low would be 6,000. Uh, the high would be 8,000. And we need to find the true airspeed. The high is 161, or sorry, the low is 161, and the high is 164. So we plug those into the, into the formula. Um, and then we get 161 plus 164 minus 60, 161. So let me, let me back it up here. Uh, if we know, I'm trying to think of the best way to do this. Yeah, so 7,500 is what we know minus 6,000 for the low over 8,000 minus 6,000. That's the high minus the low. That should equal what we don't know minus the low, 161, over 164 minus 161. Does that make sense? We basically plug it into the, uh, into the formula here, this side, and then we can solve for the one we don't know. If you like. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I, I got this. I yeah, know. yeah, cool. Yeah, I, I figured as much. Most most college dudes uh, will have this one pretty uh, down pretty uh, pretty yeah. easily. I actually took the thermodynamics and I had like practice. Awesome, great, <laughs> awesome, very cool. Uh, what, what are you studying, by the way? Uh, engineering. Uh, aeronautics engineering. Nice, very cool. Uh, cool. Uh, yeah, so you you should be pretty comfortable with interpolation. Yep. So the answer we get is one sixty three point two five. And the answers in the uh, exam are going to be pretty easy to tell, like 161 to 164, somewhere between those two. It's going to be 163-ish. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there's that. Uh, and we can totally, depending on the student, like we can totally do more problems based on you know, what they need. Uh, it seems to me that you probably un understand interpolation pretty well. So let's just move on to crosswind. Uh, so crosswind landings. Let me draw a little picture here. When we're flying, when we're coming to land, we want to have a direct headwind because that is going to uh, decrease the landing distance and slow us down. Like we're going to have a slower ground speed uh, than uh, if we have a tailwind. If we have a tailwind, the air is going to be pushing us and it's going to be a faster ground speed and we're going to touch down faster. There is a limited amount of crossing we can take. Um, and that's usually, you know, determined by a, a competent test pilot, a commercial test pilot. And so we as private pilots uh, need to be careful about what, uh, how much crosswind we put our uh, aircraft into. Uh, we, need to f we need to actually, like, use a chart to, de uh, to determine the crosswind component. And this is that chart. Super easy. Basically, we find the difference between the landing runway and the winds. So if we are landing runway 34, that's runway 340, and a wind of 310, that's going to be a 30 degree difference. We find the 30 degree arc, or the 30 degree line, 
read the 25 knot arc. That's going to be somewhere between these two, right? Because there's 20 and 30. So this arc right here. And then we're going to read the crosswind component down here on the x-axis. And was it like 13, 13 knots of crosswind? Yeah. And then sometimes I'll ask you for the headwind component. It's the same thing, just read the y-axis. Questions about that? Pretty straightforward. What was the um, horizontal component? Uh, the crosswind component. So yeah, we're going to have, if we're landing here, this x-axis is the uh, hor or the crosswind component. And then uh, the y-axis is the headwind component. Okay. And it's kind of cool. You can actually use trig to solve for this as well. But your flight instructor will be like, you're a nerd. <laughs> Ask me how I know. Okay. Uh, so yeah, like before, uh, temperature, pressure, humidity, they're going to affect our landing distance. So we need to you know, be able to account for that. The landing charts mirror the takeoff charts, and uh, they will, they're read very similarly. Uh, remember that your indicated altitude is going to be the, or sorry, your, your indicated airspeed is going to be the same because the pitot tube takes ram air and compares it to the static air. So whatever airspeed you land at is going to be the same for any given uh, altitude. Remember that tailwinds are no fun. They increase our landing distance and you need to be able to distinguish between a landing distance with and without a 50 foot obstacle. And we'll cover that here in a minute. Some landing distance tables will look like this. Some will look like the one we covered, uh, the takeoff chart we looked at last week. Uh, some things to draw your attention to. Uh, again, they are split up into different altitudes and temperatures. Uh, there are special notes we need to pay attention to, uh, like we need to decrease the distance shown by 10% for every four knots of headwind. So when they give you a problem, uh, be prepared to uh, you know, decrease it by 10% or increase it for every six degrees above standard. And uh, if you know we're on a grass runway, uh, we need to increase the roll by 20%. And with these, I, 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 like, I just like doing problems, honestly. Um, I think problems are easy, the easiest way to help you understand these. So given standard temperature, an eight knot headwind, pressure altitude of 2,500 feet, find the ground roll and landing distance to clear a 50 foot obstacle. So we're gonna look at uh, pressure altitude of 2,500 feet, that's this guy here. Standard temperature, so we don't need to worry about the second note. Uh, find the ground roll and landing distance. So that's going to be this guy here. And we're going to decrease it by 10% uh, for every eight knots, or sorry, every, every four knots. So that'll be 20% a decrease of this number here. I think that covers it. And let's see. Yeah, so we use this section decrease it by 20%. So 80% of this number comes up to 908 feet. And if we just wanted the ground roll, if we didn't want the 50 foot obstacle, then we would do this, uh, this guy here. And again, decrease it uh, by 20%. All right, questions about takeoff and landing distance calculations before we get into weight and balance? Nope. Sweet. Weight and balance is pretty straightforward, uh, especially if you're an engineer. <laughs> um, some things to remember, though, there are some key words and key phrases we want to know, uh, like empty weight. This consists of the airframe, engine, and all items of the operating equipment permanently installed in the aircraft, including special equipment, fixed ballast, hydraulic fluid, unusable fuel, and undrainable oil. So that is your empty weight. Uh, remember that your standard avgas, our 100 low lead, is six pounds per gallon and that the center of gravity is the point of balance along the airplane's longitudinal axis. So we're going to practice, you know, loading the aircraft with different things and finding our CG. Could you explain um, what the unusable fuel and oil mean? Yeah, basically there's always gonna be a little bit of fuel and oil inside the aircraft that you don't use for your uh, fuel calculations or oil calculations. Okay. Yeah. So what is the standard weight of avgas? Uh, it was on the previous slide, right? Yep. <laughs> six. That's right, six oh. pounds per gallon. Yeah, six pounds per gallon. So that's gonna, be, that's gonna come into play every time you do a weight and balance problem. They're gonna give you the number, the, the amount of fuel you've got in gallons, not in pounds, so you'll have to convert. 
So the basic formula for center of gravity calculation is WAM, weight times the arm equals your moment. Then we take the sum of the moments divided by the total weight or the sum of the weight, and that'll give you a center of gravity. And that checks, right? If you've got pounds for your weight, you've got inches for the arm equals pound inches, and then you divide pound inches divided by pounds, you're going to be left with a CG in inches, right? Yeah. So your, your units will check. And that's always a good way. I always like to use my units to make sure that all that all works out. So real basic, I'm pretty sure you probably know how to do this already, but we're going to go through it just in case. If you've got a 50, yeah, if you've got a 50 pound weight, a hundred uh, inches, a uh, hundred inch arm, uh, it's going to count it'd be 5,000 pound inches, hundred times 50. <clears throat> if we have multiple items, we want to treat all, our fulcrum point as the equal sign. Uh, basically, multiply our weight times our arm. That'll be the moment for this side. Add it to this weight times this arm, and all together, that'll be the moment on this side. And on this side, on the right side, we'll have a weight times arm comes out to a moment of 5,000. And if they balance, great. If the left side equals the right side, then they're in balance. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, actually, let's see. One second. Discard that. I'm going to animations fade. There we go. How's that? That's much better. Uh, so something to keep in mind with this one, they've given us a weight uh, and an unknown arm and another weight and a known arm. And, a, and that now the plank actually has mass as well. Um, and I'm sure you're aware, basically, we always take the center of gravity uh, and the arm for the center of gravity, not the full length of the plank when we do these calculations. So for this one, we're going to try to figure out where we need to put this 500 pound weight uh, to balance this, uh, the system. So it'll be 500 times X equals 20 times 250 for this arm and this mass plus the center of gravity, this guy, 200 pounds times 15 inches, and that'll come out to uh, 16 inches. Another way they might give you a center of gravity problem is uh, these terrible charts here. I don't particularly like them, but they are, you know, they exist, so we have to be prepared to use them. Uh, they're going to give you the different items like empty weight, pilots, baggage, fuel, and oil. And they're going to give you this chart, and you have to figure out their moments by reading down to the, to the uh, x-axis. For example, if you have a pilot and a front seat passenger of 400 pounds, we're going to find this line, read up to 400 pounds, and then read down to a moment of 15 inches. Uh, and same thing for the bag. The bag is 120 pounds, so about here-ish. Read down. Some things to keep in mind with these charts, they're a little tricky. These little uh, notes here will get people. Uh, if they're asking for standard tanks, you know, use this one. If they're asking for long range tanks, that's this one. Sometimes they won't give you a, an actual fuel value. They'll just say, using long range tanks or using standard tanks full, uh, calculate the center of gravity. And if you don't read this and it says, you know, this is standard and this is long range, you might use the wrong value, just to keep in mind. So we add up all of our moments, 88.8, .8, uh, and then we add up all of our weight, 2113, and we come over here to the bottom uh, graph. 88.8 .8 is here, and then 21113 is here. So we are well within our normal category. Do you happen to know what the normal what the difference between normal and utility category are? Um, utility category is just empty. Uh, what? not quite. So yeah, the normal category can withstand three point eight Gs, and then a utility category uh, can withstand four point four G. So you can actually do like spins and stuff in the utility utility category. Oh, those are the, the yeah acrobatic. <clears throat> yeah. All right, center of gravity tables. This is a third way that they might give it to you. Uh, it's a, it's, this is actually not so bad once you understand how they work. They're going to give you different items like your front seat occupants, your baggage, uh, your usable fuel. Here's your empty weight, auxiliary fuel tanks. 
And you're going to, you know, do the same thing. Weight times your arm. The arm is actually at the top of each. Weight times arm equals moment. Get the sum of the weights divided by the sum of the moments. No, correction. Uh, sum of the moments divided by the sum of the weights. And you'll get your center of gravity. What they might ask you for in this one is instead of solving for the, the center of gravity, they'll have you solve for a moment and ask if that's within your limits. So over here, you've got your minimum moment and a maximum moment. So for any given weight, they'll ask, is this weight and moment within uh, minimums? And if, you know, if you're at 2160 and you're at 1700 for the moment, then you're good to go. Uh, if you're at 2,900 pounds and you're at 2,500 uh, pound inches, then you are not within the, mo the min and max moment. Uh, if you're at 3,000 pounds and between these two, then you're not within weight. So that's how that will play. And uh, we actually do a, an example of this one uh, in the next lesson or the next uh, discussion. Yeah. This is... Uh... 100 de denominator means that you have to divide the or you have to multiply the moments by 100. Yeah, so the moments when you calculate it is going to be like uh, you're going to have two extra zeros for simplicity they are for like making the chart easier to read. I think they just cut out the last two zeros. Okay. Yeah, so that's how that how you read that. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, do you want to take a uh, five-minute break, or do you want to just get right into the quiz? Let's go right into it. Let's burn this candle. All right. How is engine operation controlled on an engine equipped with a constant speed propeller? Is it A? It is A. Throttle controls power output is registered on the manifold pressure gauge, and the propeller control regulates engine RPM. What's different about this and a... Uh, a um, Fixed pitch propeller is that the throttle usually controls the uh, the engine RPM, the tachometer. So now the propeller control does it. Hey, Snowy. Okay, thank you. Sorry, my dog's saying hello. <laughs> what is the expected fuel consumption for a 500 nautical mile flight under the following conditions? Pressure altitude 4,000 feet, temperature 29, manifold pressure 21.3, and winds calm. How you feeling? You feeling up to it? Yeah. Cool. Twenty-nine degrees is standard temperature, right? Uh, so for this one, I would actually read it right here. Oh, okay. Uh, I think I'm lost. No worries. Yeah, let me actually uh, run run it through. Okay, so yeah, 4,000 feet is our pressure altitude, which is right here. We're going to read our temperature, 29 degrees Celsius, and then our true airspeed of 159. When they're saying there's the winds are calm, you don't need to change your true airspeed. You don't need to convert to a ground speed. So now we do 500 nautical miles divided by 159 nautical miles per hour the nautical miles cross out, you get hours on the top, which comes out to, what was it? Uh, 500 divided by 159, 3.14 hours. And then you go to the fuel burn, gallons per hour, 11.5, which is pretty standard across the board. Uh, multiply that times your uh, fuel or your time. So that times 11.5 gallons per hour, uh, your hours cross out, and then you're left with gallons. And I got 36.1 gallons. Okay. All right, what is the headwind component for a landing on runway 18 if the tower reports the wind is 220 at 30?
B. Yeah, B, 23. So let's talk through it. Uh, 40 degree difference between uh, 220 and 180. <clears throat> 40 degrees. Uh, you read the 30 knot arc, bam, and read the headwind component, right? Headwind, yeah. 23. Bam, got it. Too easy. The arrows that appear on the north south runway indicate that the area. Uh, is it B? It's, uh, I think you're talking about these guys here. So uh, it's saying that this is, you can take off from this area, uh, but you can't land there. So you can taxi onto and take off from here, but you can't land until you get past this white mark. Oh, okay. This white mark. Yeah. Determine the total uh, distance required to land over a 50 foot obstacle given a pressure altitude of 7,500, headwind of eight knots, temperature 32, runway is hard. Is it A? It's A, that's right. And just to talk about it real quick, 7,500 feet at 32, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, headwind of 8 knots, so we're going to decrease this by 20%. So 1255 times 0.8 comes out to 1,004 feet. Get it. All right, given this situation, uh, what's, where's the EG? Or where's, where's the CG? Actually... Uh, just, I'm going to add a little one right here just to make it easier. Okay. I'm actually going to do it along with you just so, uh, get the show on the road. What'd you get? I'm still calculating. Oh, cool. Take your time. No rush. Huh, uh, 47. Interesting. Yeah, so let's see. We've got our weight and our moment for our empty weight already given. Pilot and passenger 380 times 64, I got 24,320. Is that what you got? Yes. Cool. Fuel 30 gallons uh, is 180 pounds times 96 is 17,280. Is that what you got? Yep. Cool. And then adding up our moments. 
one five one five nine three plus twenty four three two zero plus one seven two eight zero comes out to one ninety three one ninety three. Did you get that? I got the weight wrong. I got four one one zero and not two zero five five. Hmm. All right. Let's see. Fourteen ninety five. I might have got it wrong. Three eight zero plus one hundred eighty pounds. I got twenty fifty five. Cool. So uh, then you oh, divide. I I was adding the weight and I added, accidentally added twenty fifty five on top of that. Ah, nice. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So all together it comes out to ninety four oh one is what I got. All right, what is the maximum amount of fuel that may be aboard the airplane on takeoff if loaded as follows? Is that uh, negative 0 0.2 on? Yes. Yeah, actually, let's talk about that real quick. So if you have uh, the aircraft here, a lot of the time they're taking the reference point, like you know, the firewall is your reference point. So everything is inches away from the firewall. So your pass pilot, passenger, and baggage. If there's something forward of that line, it's going to be negative, a negative moment. Since it's so low, it doesn't really matter, right? I would be cautious taking that stance. Yeah. You're, you're probably right, but I'd be very careful saying that to a DPE or on the test. Okay. What do you think? All right, so in this case, uh, the question is how much fuel, what's the maximum amount of fuel we can carry? Uh, so we figured out what a good way to start is to figure out your um, weight and moments. Uh, take your sum of your moments like before. I think I got 91 and our weight ended up being, uh, let's see, 1350 plus 340 plus 310 plus 45 plus 15 pounds for the oil. That comes out to 2060 of our total weight. Yep. And with our with our moment, <clears throat> excuse me, of 91, we're in the normal category and our max takeoff weight is 2300 pounds. So 2300 minus 2060 comes out to 240 pounds. That's how much we can add to the aircraft and still be within weight limit. Now we divide that by six pounds per gallon. That comes out to 40 gallons. Let's see if I'm right. Man, 40 gallons. Oh, yes. so you just subtract the um, load from the max load. Yeah. 
exactly. Huh. Yeah. And, and it just, it just comes with practice, you know, uh, seeing what the question's asking for. Uh, it is useful to calculate your moment because if your moment's something like 80, then your max weight is going to be mm -hmm. different. Okay. I see. If 50 pounds of weight is located at point X and a hundred at point Z, uh, how much weight must be located at point Y to balance the plank? Now, what do you think? What'd you get? Still calculating. Cool. Take your time. Three hundred. Yeah, three hundred pounds. That's what I got too. Nice. Airport taxiway edge lights are identified at night by. A. They're actually blue. Yeah, taxiway lights are blue. How should the five hundred pound weight be shifted to balance the plank on the fulcrum? One unit to the left. Yeah, one inch to the left. Got it. Very nice. With the aircraft loaded as follows, what action can be taken to balance the plane? <clears throat> This one's probably going to take me longer to. Yeah. Yeah. This one does take a bit of, uh, of like messing with the numbers. So basically we calculate our, our weight and balance. 
get the sum of the weights, the sum of the moments. Uh, I'm just going to go to the next page and get those. So yeah, 2790 for the weight, the moment, things to keep in mind. The, mo the arms are all at the very top of each category. And then don't forget to calculate your fuel times six pounds per gallon. Yeah. Uh, get your sum, sum of the weight, some of the moments. Uh, 2790, uh, where is it? 2790. And 22, we lop off these two, 2222. Two, two, two. And that is just shy of being within uh, the minimum moment. Basically, what I would do is just start messing with these, you know, add auxiliary tanks to the calculations, add 100 pound weight to the baggage compartment, or transfer 10 pounds of fuel. <clears throat> if you do the math, it uh, comes out the uh, 100 pound weight in the baggage compartment. It's actually going to help you out. Um, you, you have plenty of time to run these calculations. So I would actually either, you know, go through it the first time you see this question or go hit easier problems and come back to this one uh, because they're all graded equally. How uh, long would the test? <clears throat> oh, that's a good question. Something like two hours, two and a half hours, I think. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to you on that for the exact. Actually, I'll find out right now. Uh, to do, to do, lamp, PPO, this. Yeah, two and a half hours. And there's 60, 60 questions, so you got plenty of time. Okay. All right, wingtip vortices are created only when an aircraft is. Uh, is it all of the above? Or heavily loaded? That's uh, it's uh, when you're developing lift. Yeah, because oh. heavily loaded, you could be on the ground not doing anything. Oh. And you, yeah, at higher speeds, yes, but also anytime you're developing lift. Okay. Yeah. Prior to starting each maneuver, a pilot should do what? B? Yep, visually scan the entire area for collision avoidance. We call those clearing turns. Which action can adjust the airplane's weight to maximum gross weight and, uh, and the CG within limits for takeoff? There's another uh, calculation heavy one. We'll just run through it. Basically, weight times your arm is your moment. Don't forget to multiply this times six. Here's your moment. Moment, weight, 3,004. You are over, uh, you're overweight, so we need to re, uh, you know, drain some fuel or something. And the calculation comes out that you need to drain nine gallons of fuel. Um, really, it's a process of elimination. It's probably the best way to go about it. When making routine transponder code changes, pilots should avoid which, uh, which of these codes? B. That's right. 7-6, radio's next. That's our radio is out. Bam. <clears throat> Made it. Uh, how are you feeling? Is that uh, too much calculations? Oh, that was pretty good. Cool, man. Good Sweet. Um, if you're interested... No pressure. Uh, if you want to go read up on uh, FAR 61.23 and figure out when you do and when you do not need a medical, that'd be cool. No pressure if you don't want to. Uh, definitely worth looking into. Um, yeah. you have any questions? Any feedback? It's just the two of us. Kind of cool, you know? We just talk. No? Nothing much to say. Cool, man. Well, hey, uh, I appreciate you hanging out with me. Uh, it's nice to have somebody come and talk about airplanes with. <laughs> yeah, thank you for teaching. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. I'll see you next week, same time. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, see ya.